Good morning, Boker Tov. Welcome back to Parsha Perspectives for today. As always, we begin with gratitude and thanking our generous sponsors for the Parsha series for the year, Becky and Avi Katz, and family in memory of Becky's father, David Grossman. Our learning should be Le'ilu Nishmas, David Ben, Menachem, Manash. Also this morning, she is sponsored by Essie Barry, in memory of her beloved father, Max Gopin, Baruch Mordechai, Ben, Yechezkel, Tzvi. Thank you for that sponsorship. And by Lester and Shabih Henner, in memory of Mina Henner, Michaela Bas Naftali, who's your site, who's coming, and mother of Lester Henner, and in memory of Peggy Wool, Peril Rachel Bas Yudha Ruvain, your site, mother Judy Henner. Thank you so much for your generosity. And the Shamas should all have an aliyah from our Torah learning. This morning, we have the privilege of starting the second book of the Torah. We move over to the book of Shemos, Gracious, the formulation of the first Jewish family. And then by the end of Parshas Vayechi, maybe, maybe not, they've worked out how to live as a family. When the curtain comes down in the book of Bracious, we'd like to think, we'd like to believe everybody's getting along, they've worked it out. We have the first generation that is functional, Ephraim and Menashe are getting along, the brothers have reconciled. We've discussed in the past, not clear that Yosef is truly forgiven, not true that not necessarily clear that the brothers have earned or even asked for that forgiveness. There's a lot to discuss at the end of Parshas Vayechi. But whatever it is, the curtain has come down. The Torah feels we're ready for Act 2, which is Sefer Shmos, the story of not the first family, but the story of now a nation, a nation in formation, and then what will be a nation in adolescence, a nation that is growing and experiencing growing pains, a nation that is coming together. Page 292 in the Earth Scroll, Stone Chumash. Ve'ele Shmos b'nei Yisrael, Haba'im Mitzrayma, Eis Yaakov, Ish Uveso Ba'u. These are the names of b'nei Yisrael. These are the names of the children of Yisrael who come to Egypt, Haba'im. Notice right away in the opening Pasuk, we have a grammatical shift, an inconsistency. On the one hand, we're told b'nei Yisrael, Haba'im, they are coming down. Velashen Hove, present tense, the Jewish people are still journeying. They are still descending to Egypt. On the other hand, these are the children of Yaakov. Ishu beso ba'u. They came. Did they come or are they coming? Are they B'nai Yisrael or are they the children of Yaakov? Which is it? We could spend an hour just on the opening Pasuk. Have you ever thought of these questions before? Or have you heard Parsha Shmos a million times and just you went on and turned the page? Haba'im ba'u. B'nei Yisrael, Yaakov. In the very opening Pasuk of Sefer Shmos of our Pasha, we can ask these questions. But before we get there, let's start with the Kutzker. We've been going through this beautiful Sefer, Emma Emunah, collection of the teachings of the Helega Kutzker Rebbe. So the Kutzker says the following. You ready? Ha'adam tzarech ligas atmo, yageas atmo, bepashas yitzias mitzrayim, kemo bahalacha betaisvus. A Jew, a Yid, has to delve into the depths, the analysis, has to get into the story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, the way that we study halacha and tosvos. The student in yeshiva knows when you're studying halacha, from the primary sources to the secondary sources, to the debate among the Rishonim, to try to analyze and dissect it, to try to get to what's going on. Tosvos has difficult penetrating questions, analysis, contrast, comparisons, said the Kotzker. The story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is the quintessential story of redemption. If we want to redeem ourselves from our own personal exiles, if we want to be redeemed collectively from a collective state of exile, we need to delve into the story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim with the same zeal and with the same intensity, with the same excitement and the same curiosity and quest for truth, the way that one gets involved in halacha and in tosfos. This exile is the introduction, it is the preparation, it is the paradigm for every exile we would suffer. There were four exiles. We are still in the state of the fourth exile. We're in the state of Edom. If you don't think we're in an exile, try to book a trip to Israel today. The Ribbona Shalom still does not want us to be able to simply go back when we want. We may have Jewish sovereignty over Israel, and we believe that's nothing short of a modern miracle for which we have to be overflowing with gratitude and recognition. But just because geographically we have sovereignty over that land does not mean it doesn't still have enemies or that we still have access. It's very, very painful 
for all of us as we've taken this step back and Israel shut its border yet again, a reminder, even in my whole lifetime and many of our lifetimes, we felt after 2,000 years of waiting and longing, Baruch Hashem, Israel's ours. A Jew, anyone in the world who wants to and needs to return home can. And for the last two years, that's been on hold again. So if Hashem is reminding us, don't take it for granted. Since 1948, 67, however long you've been taking it for granted, you book a trip and you go. You got to fill out 17 forms, take 40 tests, wonder still if they'll let you on, wonder if they'll let you off, wonder if they'll let you back. And all that's if you're lucky. All that's if you're lucky, if you're one of the lucky ones. It's not Pashat. So we're still in the fourth Gullus now. The Jewish people have been through many Gullus, and not just collectively as a people, as a nation, individually. Anyone who's going through a hard time, anyone who's going through a, a low, anyone who's going through a, a challenge, a conflict, is going through a personal Gullus in exile. So said the Katzke Rebbe, you want the answer, the antidote? You want the formula, how to have faith and resiliency and resolve? Study Parsha Shmos. Study this story with no less yegiya, with no less effort and toil than you delve into halacha and tosfos. It's interesting he mentions tosfos. I'll give a shameless plug for the moment tonight. We have a Rabbis on the Run series. We do People of the Book on Tuesday nights. Been doing it for years, different themes. And this year's theme is Rabbis on the Run. The rabbis who are our greatest scholars through the millennia, who when fleeing persecution were authoring some of our greatest works. It's mind-boggling. We, under a palm tree, safety and security and good weather and a pina colada and a laptop and the barilan and the otzer achachma can't compose one original paragraph of Torah thought. And some of these greatest individuals on the run, fleeing persecution, oppression, no printing press, no, no keyboard, we're authoring some of the greatest works. So tonight we'll study the rush, Rabbeinu Usher, Rabbeinu Usher, who fled from France and Germany to Spain. And one of the things we'll talk about is that he brought the, he introduced the learning of Tosfos to Spain, the learning of Talmud to Spain. They had been neglecting the whole learning of, of Talmud altogether. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I just wanted to plug my class tonight, 7.30 p.m., Rabbis on the Run. You can watch it online if you're online, and you can certainly you're encouraged to come in person. So the Kutzker says, if to delve as deep and get as deeply into it as we do anything, as we do anything else. Gam kopradu lakachas limud avor. Every detail we can extract and extrapolate how to overcome this horrible, horrible exile. Eila shemos, eila shemos. So why the shift? We mentioned the shift. So I picked up a new sefer. I occasionally buy my own svarim. I always tell you people gift me and then I include them. Once in a while, I got to buy my own svarim. I saw the sefer, Shulchan HaShabbos in Reb Nachman. Reb Nachman of Breslev. Shabbos table with Reb Nachman? Who doesn't want to go to the Shabbos table with Reb Nachman of Breslev? Don't worry, be happy, Reb Nachman. Tell me the simcha. Who doesn't want to go to the Shabbos table with Reb Nachman? Besides, look at this colorful cover. It's beautiful. Anyway, so he says the following. Who wrote this sefer? Moshe Rat and Elio Taib. I don't know who they are or where they are, but... Thank you. Shkoyach. So they quote Reb Nachman. Maybe Reb Nachman didn't write on the parsha. Reb Nachman, we have a collection of his teachings, Likute Muharan and others. And so they collected the teachings of Reb Nachman that are relevant to the parsha and organized it in the parsha and on the Pasuk. So he quotes exactly this question. Jewish people were already counted. Why are we repeating this count? The end of Sefer Bereshit, we counted the Jewish people. Now we're counting again. And the reason is, Lahodiachibasan. It is communicating Hashem's love, communicating Hashem's affection. So what is what is the value of being counted? What do we gain from that? How is that an expression of affection to be counted? Can I know I have a pretty large family? You line them up. One, two, not one, not two, one, two, three, four. Okay, everyone's here. Good. Get in the car. We're ready to go. Do they say, ah, oh, I feel so loved. Ah, oh, but that was so sweet. You know, you're counting us all up before we leave Disney to head home. Okay, you miserable, ungrateful, different. just kidding. Okay, you amazing, delicious kids. Everyone get in the car. Let's make sure you're all here. One, two, three. Okay, you're in the other two. Ah, oh, but you said I was three. Wow, I feel so loved. Where's the love? We're counting them again. We keep counting. That's such an expression of love. So Reb Nachman, when a Jew falls, you have to know that the fall is also what is good and what is right for you. Sometimes we stumble, sometimes we trip, sometimes we fall. We're off our game. 
We make poor decisions. We exhibit poor behavior in life, in relationships with Hashem, with others, in business, personally. And we have to know that when that happens, it too was not a coincidence, and it too was not chance. And it too somehow is for our own good, for us to bounce back from. It was ordained from above that for some reason we were meant to trip to stumble. We were meant to try to catch ourselves. We were meant to try to get up again. That this too is not a coincidence. Our days do not run one into the next. Life is not a continuum. And you don't say, well, I fell down yesterday, so I'm down and out. I might as well lay on the mat. I might as well be out for the count. Every single day, every hour, every moment, we begin anew. We begin again. Every moment is a fresh start. And the only thing that matters is not where we came from. The only thing that matters is evaluating where am I right now and where am I going. Not that I fall or did I rise, but when I wake up today, where am I today and where do I go next? Because if all we think about and we hold on to and we carry with us is that sense of fall, is that descent, then we will keep spiraling and we will keep falling and gravity will lower us further. But if we start again anew, anyone play golf here? One of the beauties of the game of golf, one of the beauties of the game of golf is you could draw a line in the card. You could view it as 18 holes. Or you can view it as one hole 18 times. Each hole is a new game. You draw a line on the card. You got a triple. None of you know what I'm talking about. But in the event that Tiger Woods is watching the Parsha Shear, he'll, he'll like this mushal. He'll appreciate this mushal. So if you have a bad hole, you get a triple bogey on a hole. You don't have to say, well, I just blew up. I just hit three balls out of bounds. I just went tin cup. I'm out. What's the point? Why continue? You draw a line on the card. And the next hole is a new game. And now you try to shoot for par. You try to get a birdie on the next hole. Every hole is a new game. Says Rav Nachman, he didn't give that mushal, but says Rav Nachman, in life, every day is a new hole. Every day is a new game. Every day is a new opportunity. Draw a line in the card of life and start again. And don't say, where did I come from? And I've fallen, I'm still spiraling, and I still have the pain, and why, and woe is me. But where am I today? Where is my starting point? And where do I go from here? Why am I telling you all this? Because says Reb Nachman, that's connected to our pasuk. B'nei Yisrael haba'im mitzrayma, and then Es Yaakov Yishu Beiso. How is it connected? Says the Reb Nachman in Likutei Morav Chelak Al Simur Chaf Aluf. Hashem Yisrael Masamo Madrega Gavo Ashat Sadikim. We are invoking two names because we are reflecting two attitudes. Yisrael is the higher name of the Jewish people. Yisrael is the aspirational name. Yisrael is when we are the top of our game, when we are faithful. Yisrael is who we are meant to be. That's why it is made of the letters Li Rosh. Yaakov, on the other hand, is a lowly level. A cave, it's the heel. It's the bottom of the foot. It's the lowly level. So Yaakov represents the who we are in the here and now. Yaakov represents the who we are with failures and shortcomings and struggles. And Yisrael is the aspirational who we could be. So therefore, it says Rav Nachman, Al b'nei Yisrael shem ha-tzadikim madrega gavoa nemar haba'im lashan hove she ha-tzadikim yodam she ha-nafila yirid al-mitzrayim so when we are B'nai Yisrael, Elishmo is B'nai Yisrael. When you're B'nai Yisrael, you're Ba'im. When you're B'nai Yisrael, you're not a finished product. When you're B'nai Yisrael, you're Ba'im. You're in the Hova, you're in the present tense, because every day is a new game. Every day is a fresh start. Every day is a new opportunity. We are Ba'im. I'm not a finished product. I'm not done. I'm not, this is the way it is. This is who I am. This is what you get. It's a fresh start. It's a new beginning. You could be 80, 90, 100 years old and change your life. You could decide in one day, in one moment. You could decide in one here or tshuva, in one thought, in one idea, in one conception, in one determination. And you can redefine and reinvent ourselves. So we are ba'im. In the present tense, we are inventing and reinventing and reinventing ourselves over and over and over again. Whereas Yaakov, who are on the lower level, ishu beso ba'u. What you see is what you get. We came. This is who we are. This is where we're at. My growth happened in yeshiva. My growth happened in college. My growth happened in my shanari shon of marriage. And now I'm locked in. This is who I am. This is my patience level. This is my eating habit. This is my sleeping habit. This is my davening habit. This is who I am. I decided at 22 years old who I am. And the rest of my life, I'm just reliving that same year over and over again. That's Yaakov. That's a Yaakov attitude. Asher ba'u. Came. Done. Finished product. Complete. 
A Yisrael attitude is Habaim. We are constantly coming, we're constantly reinventing over and over and over again. Okay, a lot more to say about that, but back to our opening pasuk. Elishimos. So Rashi told us, Lo kochavim. And why is it an act of affection? Because if I count my kids, putting them back in the car on the way home from Disney, what an act of affection. And I say, Kindalach, you like the stars of the sky. They count you over and over again. What's the affection and what's the connection to the stars of the sky? So I want to share with you very quickly three or four different interpretations of this. We've shared others in previous years. I believe these are all new and we haven't seen them yet before. Why specifically are we likened or linked to the stars? So if Simcha Vasiman, who is Rosh Shiva Oral Khan, Rav Khan Vasiman's son, so he said the following. He said, we know the Jewish people are compared to a tzava, to an army. The Jewish people are likened to soldiers in an army. The army is made up of two kinds of soldiers. The average soldier, the average private, is just a number. What number are you soldier? What number are you private? But the higher up you go and the higher up you rank, and now I will reveal how little I know. I don't know what's higher, sergeant, lieutenant, general. General is high. Five-star general, very high. So the higher you go the more distinct of a title you have and the more you're known by your name, General Schwarzkopf, General Patton. Okay, that's my list of generals. So general, whatever general name that you have, you're known by your name, the higher up you go to center of Simchavasim. And he says there are two types of soldiers. Are you a private or are you a general? Are you just a number or are you a name? So the Pasuk said back in Bereshis, Hashem said, I will go outside and look up and count the stars if you can. Thus, this will be like your children. We've shared insights on that in the past. Lablina Rav and Meir Shapiro about in particular. The Jewish people, we are an army. We're an army. Why are we like into an army? What are we, uh, violent? We embrace violence? Chas v'shalom. We're an army. The image of the army, like the Rebbe's army, is we are an army who's meant to go transform the world. We're not meant to sit at home. We don't live with rights and entitlements. It's not all what can I take from this world, but rather it's what can I do? What can I give? How can I transform? We serve in the army. So the danger is if I'm in the army, I'm just a number. I'm just a private, I'm just a number. I just blend in. What's special? What's distinct about me? Does anyone even know my name? So the Pasuk tells us, We just said in davening this morning, so it says of Simcha Vasserman, what you know what's affection? Hashem says on the one hand you're a private. Fall in line. Feel you're of service to others. Serve. Be on a mission. Transform the world. But that doesn't mean you forfeit, forfeit your identity or your distinction. Simultaneously we have a name. Simultaneously Hashem knows who we are. And that is the expression of affection. What was the affection is not just that you are like the stars, that you are anonymous, or that you just blend in, or that you have nothing special about you. It's that unlike other armies where everyone's just a private, or unlike stars that are just a number of a star, we have a name. Hashem knows who we are and what we are about. He knows what is our unique and distinct mission that the world is waiting for us for. Rav Moshe Shapiro had a different interpretation. Why are we connected to stars? He said the following. And why not the sun? The sun is the source of light. The sun is the sort of illumination, energy, warmth, brightness. Stars, what are the stars? They just reflect the light of the sun. It's not even the moon. So Moshe Shapiro said the following. So whatever Hashem created, He created for its purpose, for its use, for its mission. The sun provides light to the world and it warms the world. If the earth were just a little bit further from the sun, we would freeze. Human beings couldn't exist. If the earth were a little bit closer to the sun, we would burn up. We would be destroyed. We'd burst into flames. It's the Chachma Sabore. The earth is the exact distance from the sun it needs to be. The only distance it could be for there to be life on earth. Brilliant, brilliant. Hashem's Chachma. All you have to do is study nature and you see Hashem's guiding hand. Malah Aretz Kenyanecha. So the sun intrinsically has this value, this purpose, and this role. Kach Gam Halavana. The moon also has its role. The moon reflects the light of the sun. It gives us the ability to navigate and to be able to get around at night with a more limited light, but enough light, the light of the sun. And the reflection of the light from the moon 
also enables certain growth of other species, that which doesn't rely on and depend on the sun. What about the stars? That's the sun, that's the moon. What about the stars? Why are the stars here? What do we need the stars for? For a pretty sky? We've already ruined that. So much artificial light, you can't even see the stars in the sky. What do we need the stars for? We all know the Medrash, that the moon and the sun were competing who has dominion in the sky. And Hashem made the moon shrink. And in order to appease the moon, which had to serve the sun and was smaller, he said, don't worry, I'm going to create legions of stars, and those legions of stars will all serve you. Said Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, that's why the Jewish people are likened to stars. Because the star's whole purpose is to make the moon happy. And we need to know that our own purpose in this world and in this life is not our own happiness, is not the pursuit of our own pleasure, but is to bring happiness and joy to others. Now it happens to be, and modern psychology has now proven this through countless research, that if you want happiness and pleasure, don't focus on your own happiness and pleasure. When you make others happy, then you become happy. But says Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, I love this insight. It says, why are we likened to the stars? Because unlike the sun, whose purpose is the sun, and the moon, whose purpose is the moon, the star's entire purpose is to make the moon happy. So we are not like the sun or the moon, we're like the stars. Because we're supposed to, we're meant to think, you know, my purpose, my existence, is not about my happiness, but rather is about the happiness of others and making the world a better and a happier place. Okay, one or two more quick interpretations on this. And then we move on past the first Pasuk. Bichil Mechel the great Aruch HaShulchan, wondered, what happened? Forget the stars now. We're moving on from the stars. Uh, okay, no, we'll stick one more thing with the stars. Lahodia. One more word, Lahodia. What is Lahodia? Purim Lahodia. Not Purim Lahodia. Lahodia. Rashi says, Lahodia Chibasam. You should know the affection. Know how much Hashem loves you. He counted the Jewish people then. Why? You like the stars. When you love something, you continuously count it. Lahodia. To whom is Hashem Modia? To whom is he directing that Lahodia? Lahodia to who? Art scroll. Lahodia to Koran. Lahodia to Hertz. Lahodia to the Bible, Madro at the hotel. Who is he Lahodia? Lahodia Chibasam. To whom? So in the Sefer, the Sitcha Elyon, this beautiful Sefer, he says the following. Davka Pasha Zush, Matril Dabra Lashibud, Hanoshev Mitzrayim, Ishtabdu Bidisrael. You know, right when we're about to read the story of sinking low, we're about to delve into the story of exile. We're about to remind ourselves of our own exile. We're about to re-experience our own challenges and suffering. Right now is when we need a little affection. We need a little bit of love. When you're riding high, when everything's success, when everything's going right and everything's well, you don't need that extra affection. When do you need a little bit of a hug? When do you need a little bit of affection? When do you need a little bit of a positive word? When you're heading into Gullus. We're heading into Gullus. Hashem begins the Sefer Shmos with a hug. Lahodia. He's giving you and me that hug. The Lahodia. To whom is he giving this affection? To you and to me, to all of us. I love that imagery. That as we're beginning Sefer Shmos, and as we're beginning the story of exile, and as we're beginning to experience the suffering of Egypt, Lahodia Chibasan. Hashem is giving us a shtickle hug on in the way in. Why does the Torah describe it as habaim and ba'u? Ba'im and ba'u are the verb to go. But what verb was used earlier? Shalar HaShulchan, Rechil Mechel Epstein, points out in his parish on the, on the Haggadah called Lel Shimurim. He says, why is there a shift? Parshas Migash, Parshas Miketz, sorry, it says, you read this Kla Yisrael Mitzrayim, Rudu Shama, Vayardu Ache Yosef, Vayakuma Vayardu Mitzrayim, so we've been talking about Yerida, a descent into Egypt. Why are we shifting from the description of going down? In Bracious, it was all about going down. The descent, going down. And now all of a sudden we start Shemos with Habaim, Asher Ba'u. Which is it? Is it a Yerida? Is it a descent? Is it going down? Or is it Ba'im and is it Ba'u? Which one is it? As I frack the Arach HaShulchan, this is the question of the Arach HaShulchan. This is his question. This is his question. And he says, he gives his own tarots there in the Haggadah. He quotes here a different answer from Rechaim Friedlander, the Mashkiach of Panovich. I'm not even going to tell you his, I'm going to tell you my answer. I'll tell you my answer. My answer, I don't know if it's correct, more correct, less correct, or correct at all than the other answers. But my answer is, 
On our way down to Egypt, it was a sense of Yerida. A person had to know where you were going. From Canaan, from a land that's holy and sacred, to a place that's corrupt, morally depraved, decadent, you had to know it's Yerida. If you don't have a mindfulness and an awareness that you're going into a place which will assault your values, into a place which can compromise and corrupt you, you're in trouble. You have to know it's a Yerida. But once you're there, that's where you're meant to be. Bo. Once you're there, that's where you're meant to be. And you need to know, I need to make the best of who I am, where I am. Don't give up and say, because I'm here, I might as well be like them. And don't say, how could I be here? Why would I be here? I guess Hashem wants me to be like them. If he didn't, he wouldn't have let me be here. So on the way there, maybe it's Yerida. But once we're beginning Sefer Shmos and we're already there, then a person has to know, this is where I'm meant to be. Where did I come up with that? Rav Nevensal in his beautiful Svarim and Chumash says later, Parshas Bamidbar, we're going to talk about the different encampments in the desert. We've shared this before. So in the episode of the rebellion of Korach, which tribe suffers the most casualties? Korach comes from which tribe? Levi. And yet Levi doesn't suffer the most casualties. Anyone know? Which tribe suffers the most casualties? Reuven. Says of Nevensal. And why did Reuven suffer the most casualties? They lived alongside Korach. So when Korach recruited others to be in this rebellion, and Korach made this breakaway shu, I mean breakaway from Moshe. So he recruited these other people. The ground opened up and swallowed them up. And Ruvain suffered terrible losses. And Chazal conclude from there, Oyla Rasha, Oyla Shechina. If you're a neighbor of somebody who is fomenting a rebellion and you're indifferent, you're apathetic, let alone you cooperate, Oyla Rasha, Oyla Shechina. You know, you're, you're, you're accountable too. So Ruvain takes this terrible dive. So Rav Nevensal says, could you imagine Ruvain gets upstairs and says to Hashem, you, I didn't randomly choose to live there. It wasn't the realtor who showed me that house. I didn't buy it out of foreclosure or get it at a bargain. Hashem, you told me to live there. Not like you told me I had some premonition or I went to a Makubal or a Rebbe. Like you actually told me this is where you're meant to live. Hashem designated the encampments in the desert. So can't Ruvain say, Hashem, you told me to live there? And now as the result, I went down with Korach? So Nevin Sal says, yeah. Even when you find yourself listening, living next to a Russia, you need to believe this is where Hashem meant me to be. Now I still need to be the best version of myself. We can't think, well, if I'm here, then I might as well be like them. Hashem wouldn't want me to be here. How did I end up here? Wherever we are is where we're meant to be, and we're meant to be the best version of ourselves nonetheless. So maybe that's the answer from Yerida to Abiyah. You're dim to Asher Ba'u. Because on the way down, we have to know we are falling. But once we get there, once we get there, we should realize that's where we're meant to be and to be the best version of ourselves once we are once we are there. Okay, let's keep going. Pasuk Vav. We're flying now. So we mentioned the different names that count the Jewish people. Again, B'nai Yisrael, Poro We were fruitful. We multiplied. We filled the land. We filled the land. And a new king arose who did not know Yosef. A new king. A new king arose. So, I'm sorry, I skipped. Go back to Pasuk Vav. Vayamas Yosef b'cholachal b'chol adorahu. Yosef and his brothers and the entire generation died. Vayamas Yosef b'esachal b'chol adorahu. Says the Orachayim HaKadosh. Says the Orachayim. Ba'akasub loma shekozman she'echem ya'achem kayim hayu amitzra mechabdim in Bnei Yisrael. Why does the Torah describe that Yosef died and the brothers died and the whole generation and now all of a sudden, now the oppression, the persecution will begin? Why was the oppression and persecution delayed as long as they were alive? So the simple understanding, what I would have said is, in their merit, they were righteous, they were pious, they were great people. In their merit, the oppression, the persecution was delayed. But that's not what the Orachayim says, it's not what the Pasuk says, not what Chazal say. Chazal says, as long as the brothers were alive, the Mitzram were Mechabdim B'nai Yisrael. As long as the brothers, dignitaries, distinguished holy people walking around who represented a certain life, a certain lifestyle, a certain set of values, the Egyptians respected, they admired, and they therefore held back from persecuting the rest of the Jewish people. The Jewish people were chashub in the eyes of the Egyptians. 
And when, when someone is chashiv to you, you're not going to enslave them. To enslave, you enslave someone because you think that they're lowly. You enslave the one that you think is inferior. You enslave and you make the person you feel should be a subject to you. But when you feel that somebody is great, when you admire, when they're elevated in your eyes, then you can't subjugate them. So as long as the brothers, as long as the Jewish people were elevated, the Egyptians couldn't subjugate. The precursor, the prerequisite to the capacity to subjugate was the fact that they no longer admired. They were no longer elevated. They no longer respected. Really, at first they were elevated. Then when Yosef died, they became equals. And then when the brothers died, they became lower. This was the descent. First, Yosef, ooh, this is Yosef's our vice. Yosef's the secretary of the treasurer. Yosef saved the economy of Egypt and the whole world. Wow, it's a brilliant mind, a spiritual giant. Yosef's superior to us. We love, we embrace, we welcome the Jewish people. When Yosef died and it was just the brothers, they're pretty good. They're just like us. They're like us. And when the brothers died, everyone else who had some so, so assimilated and integrated, they're lower than us. They're less than us. Now we can subjugate and now we can persecute. It's a very, very important, a very powerful insight. Why am I sharing it? Because in Sichos Musar, Rucham Shmulevitz, the great Mashkiach, Rucham Shmulevitz says, this is true not only about our external enemy, and this tells us about Jewish history. When does the external enemy think that they can knock the Jewish people? When we are not living in a way in which they see us as elevated. When they see us living a holy, virtuous life, when we're living a better version of ourselves, they can't bring themselves to subjugate, to persecute. But when we ourselves are, are lower, when we're failing to realize who we're meant to be, when we're not living that level of sanctity and holiness that we could and that we should, now we've created the Pesach, the opening for them to come. It was true not only then, says Rechaim Shalevitz, says the Orachayim HaKadosh, it's true now. But Rechaim Shalevitz goes further. And he says, if this is true about the um, conflict with the external enemy, it's also true in our conflict with our internal enemy. I, I wish I could read it to you, but there's so much more I want to get to. He says, the Yetzirah, you know when the Yetzirah can get you? When you don't see yourself as elevated, when you don't see yourself as special, when you don't see yourself as royalty, as a banner bas melech, when you say I'm ordinary and I'm nothing special and I'm lowly and I give in to my drive and my instinct and I'm pathetic and I'm a gornished, and the Yitzhahara says, I'm jumping on top of that. I'm jumping all over that. But when we're chashuvim in our own eyes, and that's why the Jewish way to educate our children, you know, Jap, Jewish American princess, was always an insult. But it's a compliment because we are supposed to see ourselves and project ourselves and our children that that the whole Jewish attitude of pasnished, it's pasnished, it's beneath you. We don't say don't do that because it's wrong. Don't do that because it says don't do that. We say don't do that because it's beneath you. You're better than that. You're capable of more than that. You're royalty. Do you know who you are? Do you know from whom you descend? Do you know that you're a chilek aloka mimal mamish? Do you know who was inside you and what you're capable of and what is your potential and what you could realize? So the more elevated we see ourselves in our own eyes, not from an egotistical standpoint, not from an arrogant standpoint, but if we understand who we are, where we come from, what we're capable of, then the Sahara won't have any opening to get us. But if I say I'm a gornished, I'm a nothing, and I keep giving into my impulse and my drive, and I come from nothing and I'm going nowhere, then that's when the Sahara. So that's a false and a counterfeit humility. We think that's a humility, that's actually exactly what nourishes the Yitzhahara. Where do you see that? Says Rechaim Shalavitz. You see it from this Orachayim. Vayamas Yosef v'cholachav v'choladorahu. First Yosef died, we went down a notch. Cholachav, we went down a notch. Choladorahu, we were so lowly, now the Egyptians trampled us. Now they persecuted us. Now they jumped all over us. The lower, lower, lower we're seen by others and we see ourselves in our own eyes, the more vulnerable, the more susceptible we are, the more we are inviting the persecution of others. Person has to realize godless ha'adam, never olam, chashav ani ka'olam malay. The whole world's here for me. This is what Chazal are encouraging us. Godless ha'adam. We have to know ma'at me'elokim, we're just beneath God. We have to know who we are, what we're capable of, from where we descend, and when we see ourselves as elevated and great, what we are capable of, then we will be protected not only from the external enemy, the internal one as well. Vayakam melach chadash. Torah tells us a new king rose. Now we're up to Pasach Ches. 
Again, we've shared a lot of insights on this, trying to give you new material each and every year. Back to our good friend. We're going back to the Shabbos table with Rav Nachman of Breslov. Hilliger of Nachman. Rashi quotes the famous Machlokas Rav and Shmuel. You know this Machlokas. Melach Chadash, a new king. Does this mean literally a new king? Or does it mean the same king with a new attitude? Is Melach Chadash that there was an election? Or the dictator was overthrown? Or he simply died? And there was a new king? A new king took the throne and this new king had not experienced Yosef's salvation and therefore he didn't have the appreciation of Yosef's progeny and descendants and therefore he oppressed the Jewish people. Was it literally a new king or Melech Hadash, the same king with a new attitude? The same king with a new attitude who's now capable of Gzeros Chadashos. It's possible that there are people who did unprecedentedly good things for Israel and the Jewish people just a short while later in an interview could say horrific things about Israel and the Jewish people. The same person can flip and become a Melech Hadash. Same person whose whole life is transactional and you learn only who ever did it for themselves. Vayaka Melech Hadash. Amei Yavin, we can imagine in our own time, it's not so beyond our grasp, that that same person could be a Melech Hadash. They could be a Melech Hadash when it doesn't serve them, it serves them differently. So this is the Machlokas, Rav and Shmuel. Is Melech Hadash a new king or the same king with a brand new attitude? That was definitely going to get me a few emails. The second opinion, that it was the same king with a new attitude, he knew Yosef, the same king. This is the king, this is the paro, whose dreams were interpreted by Yosef. This is the paro, who Yosef literally saved the economy. This is the paro, who Yosef served as his viceroy, as his vice president. So how could it be? He made himself as if he doesn't know. And what did he do that was so egregious in that moment? What an expression of ingratitude. Yosef saved the economy. He saved the kingdom. He saved Paro. He saved the whole world. And this Melech Hadash, because it no longer served him because he had a new attitude towards Yosef, now not only failed to continue to be grateful, but actually flipped and began to persecute and oppress, oppress and target Yosef's own descendants. How much of an ingrate do you have to be to do such a thing? How ungrateful! How ungrateful! Said Rab Nachman, a lack of gratitude is among the worst qualities a person could have. Now, why is ingratitude so terrible? Okay, so you're not grateful. Someone did a nice thing for you, and you couldn't even bring yourself to say thank you. You couldn't pay the debt of gratitude. You didn't have the humility to realize someone did for you. Okay, it's not nice. I don't want to be mashadach my children to you. It's not nice. Not that anybody's ever asked me, by the way, in the Shidduch Inquisition. Are they grateful? Do they say thank you? Nobody's ever asked that. When they're taking their medicines, do they say thank you? Which medicines they take? Do they say thank you to the pharmacist for the medicines I want you to tell me they take? Nobody's ever asked that. So ingratitude. Why is it such a terrible meter? Why is it so terrible, says Rav Nachman? And the answer is because of kfira. Kfira? What heresy is there in ingratitude? Why is that an act of kfira? So it says, look at the Pasuk. And what happens when you start with Hashem lo yada Yosef? Then you get to lo yadati es Hashem. This paro when Moshe comes to him says lo yadati es Hashem. I don't know God. What God? I don't have a relationship with God. There's a God? Oh no, all this is me. All this is the Jordan River. All this is because I'm a deity. Our thriving economy, it's me. Our agricultural society and system, that's me. This palace and its opulence is all me. God? This power turns to Moshe and says, Lo yadati es Hashem. I don't know what you're talking about. So Rabbi Nachman says, how did Paro ever get to Lo Yadati Es Yosef? Get to Lo Yadati Es Hashem. You know how you arrive at Lo Yadati Es Hashem? When you start with Lo Yadati Es Yosef. If you're ungrateful to people, you'll be ungrateful to God. You can't see God, feel God, hear God. How are you going to be grateful to God? So it begins with people. But if you're not even capable of being grateful to the person who you experienced in the flesh who did something kind for you, you're certainly not going to be grateful to God. So lo yada es Hashem began with lo yada es Yosef. You see, you can't separate. Some people want to distinguish, excuse me, differentiate between mitzvahs, between us and God, and between us and other people, but it's all interconnected, and it all goes together. 
because we have to realize the Medjish HaGadol says at the beginning of Shmos, Kol HaKofer B'Tovasa Shel Chaveiro, Levasov Kofer B'Tovasa Shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If you're ungrateful to people, in the end you'll be ungrateful to God. If you deny the goodness and the kindness that people do for you, then you'll be living in denial that God does good for you. So gratitude and the interpersonal connection and capacity to be grateful is all connected to our relationship with Hashem. Ayin Rafutner, why the same word modeli, modeal, we've spoken out that Rafutner countless times. So you see that loyadas Hashem began with loyadas Yosef. What a beautiful insight by the Heligar of Nachman of Breslov. Gratitude. Ingratitude is a core corrupt negative quality. Why? Not only because it's demeaning, not only because it is offensive to the people around us, but because ultimately it leads to kfira. If we don't have the humility and the recognition to be grateful to people, we can never live with the humility and gratitude to be grateful to Hashem. It all goes together. It all goes together. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, let's see what's next. Aleph Yudzayim. We're turning the page. Don't get whiplash. We're going this fast. Page 294. What happens? So the Jewish people promulgate and propagate. We have this enormous population explosion and growth, and the power is threatened, understandably. They have a very low birth rate. We have a very high birth rate. And Paro is concerned about being overwhelmed by this nascent, by this currently subjugated people that they're going to rise up and they're going to overcome. So what does he do? He, of course, calls for the murder of all the of all the boys. Pa, the king of Egypt, tells these uh, midwives, whose names are Shifra and Pua, Yocheved and Miriam, let the girls live. He wasn't threatened by them. But the boys have to be extinguished. What was his methodology, by the way? What was his thought process? What was going to happen if you let the girls live? Girls are not capable. Why did he think? What did he think was going to happen? What do you think was going to happen? So he knew. I forgot where I saw this. Where did I see this? I forgot where I saw this. But he knew that there's a natural female instinct to want companionship. It's not to say that men don't also want companionship. But that women yearn for companionship. They want to be together. That's why the halacha is, don't beat me up, the halacha is a man can't marry a woman without seeing her first because maybe ultimately he won't be attracted and then it'll be a violation of a haflorecha kamocha. But a woman can be married through shlichos without seeing him first because... Even if he's not as handsome as the Shadchan said, she yearns for the companionship. She doesn't want to be alone. That was Chazal's intuition, instinct. That was what the Gemara and Kedushin concludes. Okay, everybody relax. Everybody relax. Everybody relax. It happens to it happens to have some element of truth. If you see me and my wife together, you know that we are a living example of some element of truth. Women are willing to settle, and men only want to be with somebody who is very beautiful. So... Chazal, so Paro understood, Paro understood that women crave companionship. So here was his methodology. This was his strategy. Let the girls live, kill the boys. The girls will be desperate for shiduchim, just like now. There's too few boys, too many girls. So what's going to happen for these girls, ultimately? They're going to go to the Egyptian club, Egyptian bar. They're going to finally turn to the Egyptian shachan. And they're going to say, I don't want to be alone. So Paro said, what is the best strategy to get full assimilation into marriage integration so I won't be threatened by this distinct people? I'll let the girls live. They will marry in and will eliminate the Jewish people. A very, very interesting interpretation. A very interesting interpretation. What did he see? So Hashem sees them. So Pasuk says, so look at these psukim. Vatiranam yaldos elokim, Shifra and Pua, Miriam and Yochebed saw God. Velo asuka shar diber leim. So therefore they did not do what the king asked them to do. Vatariyana se yeladim, and they let them live. Vayikram elch mitzrayim lem yaldos. The king called them, and he said, "Why are you doing this?" And they said, "Ah, they're different. What can I do? They're giving birth without us, and so on." Fast forward to pasuk chavalaf. Vayihi ki yaru am yaldos se elokim. And it was because they feared God, Vayas Lahem Batim. Hashem made them homes. And what were the homes he made? Zakdarashi, Bate Kahuna, Levia, Umalcha, Shakriam Batim. We know that the positions of distinction among the Jewish people are called the Bate Kahuna, 
the homes of Kahuna, Leviya, and Malchus. These are the Batim that Miriam and Yochavet got. They were the progenitors of royalty and of priesthood. That was their reward for the fact that what? Finish the sentence. That was their reward for what? So Belio Lopian, and his Lev Elio points out, I would have thought that's the reward for what? Enabling the children to live. Saving the Jewish people. Securing Jewish continuity. For the courage. Last night, Rav David Yosef, one of the sons of Rav Avadia, Rav David Yosef spoke last night very beautifully, very brilliantly, and he pointed out that we think that the Miriam and Yochevet had two choices, to obey the king or to disobey. And they had a third choice, to run away. And they didn't do that. They had the courage to stay and disobey. They didn't do that third choice. He spoke very beautifully. So they stayed. They had incredible courage. But I would think, why are they being rewarded for the courage to disobey and for securing Jewish continuity, a Jewish future, for saving these Jewish babies? Says Ravel Yeropiyam, that's not what the Pasuk says. That's not what it says. Could you imagine? Um, we have a funeral right after this. Marcus Whitstam, one of our beloved members, passed away. So I'm going to mention at the funeral, he was named after his uncle, Marcus Whitstam, a Polish Jew who moved to Ireland, who during the Holocaust opened a factory in Ireland and secured visas for Jews from Poland, whom he claimed had expertise to come work in his factory, and he was known as the Irish Oscar Schindler. He was a Jew who saved hundreds of lives. So imagine somebody saves hundreds, thousands of lives. And then you say about them, wow, they're unbelievable. We're going we're gonna to name a street in Yad Vashem in Israel after the person who saved thousands of lives. Why would you say you're rewarding them? Yeshua Soploni, Umayim Yir Hashemayim Shalom. Can you imagine someone says, oh, it's beautiful. He saved lots of lives. Did they have any Yir Hashemayim? Yitmu Kulam V'yom Ramazan Ogea. Oscar Schindler, I'm not sure how much Yir Hashemayim he had. But he saved a lot of Jewish lives. We still made a movie about him. We still acknowledge him. Nobody asks what, what was with his Yerushalayim. Who cares? He saves a lot of lives. Their reward came and their motivation and drive came because they feared God. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to acknowledge and have a great appreciation to Schindler or others, whether they're God-fearing or not. But the Torah is telling us something very, very special here. This is another level. There are people who save children because they can't stand the cry of a child, because of humanity, human, humanitarian reasons. These two women were not driven by humanitarian reasons. Because humanitarian reasons can spin in both directions. The Nazis thought that they were humanitarian by ridding the world of the lowly Jew. Hitler was elected de democratically. He was democratically elected. The German people believed that they were doing the humanitarian thing by cleansing the world of these lowly Jew. The moment we're driven by humanitarian motivation, that can spin in different directions. You can, you can get a democratically elected Nazi party led by a Hitler for humanitarian reasons. These women, Miriam and Yocheba, were not driven by humanitarian reasons. They were driven by being God-fearing. They were here to serve God, and they were God-fearing. And they were God-fearing, and that was the reason for the reward. The reward came not for saving Jewish lives. The reward came for being God, for being God-fearing. For being God-fearing. Kutzker says a similar thing, but we will move on. Let's keep going. Vayitzav Paro. Oh, Vayitzav Paro. Beautiful stifler. So Paro tells them what has to happen. We're now on Perak Aleph Pasuch of Beis. Last Pasuch of the Perak. Top of page 296. Every boy, Vaitzav Paro, should be cast into the Nile, into the river, and every door shall you be kept alive. Rashi says, L'chol Amo. He tells the whole nation. Afalem Gazar. Yom Shanolad Moshe Amrlo. It's like Miusav Hayanolad. Moshe, he did this even to his own nation. All the boys have to be killed. Why? Because his astronomers, his astrologers, his psychic friends network came to him and said that they had a premonition. They said, they said, Paro, the savior of the Jewish people is going to be born today. A boy. Paro says, I don't know if it's a Jewish boy or an Egyptian boy. Throw him all in the Nile. Throw him all in the Nile. Throw him all in the Nile. 
Paro knew that he would strike the river, the water. That's why he said, throw them all into the into the water. The stipler Gom, Chan Kanievsky's father, the stipler in his Birchas Peretz, says the following unbelievable, incredible idea, something we all know, but we fail to have the scope or the context sometimes to realize. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Klal Yisrael are in a terrible golos. Paro, the emperor of the world, the most powerful man on the earth, ordains, enacts, every boy should be thrown in the river. Every boy should be thrown in the river. Paro, lo lakach shum sikunim, ne'aregashez barer lo she'asida shem mitzrayim omei b'sakana, hu yifels kola mitzrayim she'am delashu. So the moment he felt threatened, he employed everything he could to protect his own power and his Egyptians, which included killing countless babies of his own nation, of his own people. Why? Because he said, I'm the emperor. I'm in the position of power. There's a baby born today who's going to be the one who saves, emancipates these people. Not on my watch. I'm the emperor. I'm all powerful. I have the ability to not only murder every Jewish boy, every Egyptian boy, I can micromanage. I can control the situation. I can eliminate the threat. How did Hashem orchestrate things? Um, I'm, this is not my first time reading Parsha Shmos, but I never appreciated the story being described in this way, the way the stipler does. Paro says, I'm all powerful. Paro says, I'm a deity. Paro says, I'm in control. I can manage. I can eliminate any threat. Hashem says, ha! <laughs> ha! Guess where I'm going to put that savior? In the very river that you're saying to throw all the boys. And guess who's going to discover him? Your daughter. And guess where he's going to be raised? Under your nose in your palace. You can micromanage. You can eliminate every threat. You're in charge. You're in control. Ha! You know where that savior, not only can you not eliminate him, he will be saved. Not only will he be saved, he'll be saved in the very place that you think that you could most expeditiously eliminate. And not only will he be saved, will he be saved by whom? Your own daughter. And where will he be raised and trained in royalty? In your palace, by your servants, under your nose. And what will his name be? You know that kid in the high chair at your dining room royal table that you think is so adorable and cute? And you're going to call him Moshe, little Moshela? Where did his name come? From Minamaya Meshisihu, from that very water that you said was going to destroy and eliminate the threat and you could micromanage and was a deed and was a God. The, the irony, this is the iron, the origins of irony. The Rebona Shalom, the Almighty, is using the tool of irony to show power. You think you're in charge. You think you're in control. You think you can micromanage. You think you can eliminate. Ha! Right under your nose, by your daughter, in the very water, he orchestrates the entire, entire thing. And why does he do it? There's an amazing Ibn Ezra. Why? Why was it designed from above that Moshe would specifically be raised and grow up in a palace? Moshe who needs to and wants to feel the pain of his brothers. Moshe who goes out in order to empathize. Why did he grow up with his people? Why did he grow up in the palace? The Ibn Ezra says, because if Moshe was going to confront royalty, he had to be like royalty. If you grow up a slave, you have a slave mentality. This comes back to the word we said before, pasnish. If we want our children to behave like royalty and to see the allures of this world as being beneath them, then we have to train them and condition them to see themselves as royalty. You're royal, that's beneath you. We don't speak like that. We don't dress like that. We don't act like that. We don't think like that. We don't go there. You're royalty. You're royalty. That's not who we are. That's not how we behave. By Kellerman, by Lawrence Kellerman. His book, To Kindle a Soul, tells the story of his son, Kadosh. He tells an amazing story. They were on a family to Yule during a Ben Azmanim, and they're in the car, and as inevitably, invariably happens, one of his children desperately needs to use a bathroom. They can't find the bathroom. They finally find a rest stop, and they're about to run into the bathroom, and he's running with his little child to go use this bathroom. He desperately needs it in the last moment possible, and the kid stops. And his father says, or Kellerman says, you said you have to go to the bathroom. You said you only have a few moments to go. We're here, there's a bathroom, let's go inside. And his son sheepishly looks up at him, a little boy, and he says, I can't. He says, what do you mean you can't? You said you need to go to the bathroom. He says, Abba, my name is Kadosh, and this is a bar. I can't go to the bathroom in here. Because if you give your son the name holy and you raise him to believe that he's holy, he simply won't be capable of going into an unholy place. 
Pasnish, do we teach our children their royalty? So the Ibn Ezra says, Moshe grows up in a palace, so he believes I'm royal. And therefore, that first time he has to go knock on the palace door to say, Paro, let my people go, he doesn't demure and he doesn't hesitate and he doesn't say, I'm a little slave, maybe, if it's okay, if you don't mind, it's possible, maybe you'll let them go. He goes and he bangs on the door and he demands, let my people go, because I'm royal. I'm a prince. I know royalty. I grew up in this palace. So the Ibn Ezra says, the very Rafua came before the Maka. Where did Moshe get the very skill set that would position him to be the savior of the Jewish people? He learned it from Paro. Who was his mentor and how to have the courage to be able to demand, let my people go? Hashem's irony that he built in here is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Moshe learns the very skill set that enables him to liberate the people. He learns from the very dictator who is oppressing them. So the stipler helps us zoom out the lens and get a little scope to see the storyline, the subtext of the storyline, and Hashem's orchestration and irony of it is absolutely unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Okay, we only have time for a few more quick ideas. Everyone knows about Bisya, the daughter of Para, who stretched her arm out, and the miracle that it extended. The miracle is not that it extended, because that's Hashem did, not her. Says the Kutzker, you know what the miracle is? If she knew the basket was floating too far away from where she was, why'd she put her arm out? The answer is that if you see someone in pain and you want to help, you don't think to yourself, you don't calculate. Someone bring me a measuring tape, let me see if I can reach or not. If someone's screaming, you simply reach. And then when you reach, Hashem does the rest. How many people have done things that make no sense? And then in the end, it brings a salvation, a redemption. It brings a solution. Or if they stop and they plotted and they thought and they strategized, they never would have started. But because instinctively, we leap, we have faith, we believe, we do. If you're a doer, Hashem will do the rest. But if you start, stop and pause to calculate, it will never, it will never happen. Vaigdal Moshe, Moshe grows up. Vaigdal Moshe. We haven't seen a Imre uh, Chaim in a long time. Where is this in Rechaim, I want to tell you? Perek Be'ez, Pasek Gidalaf. Vayidah Moshe Vayitze El Achav. Says the Rechaim, the vision it's there. Gidulasa uktushasa shal Moshe ba'ulo mitseso el achiv. Aide hiskashrusa bidibu chaverim. Vayidah Moshe Vayitze El Achav. Gidulasa. Where does greatness come from? A person might think, you know what makes you great? Get away from people. People are the worst. People bring you down. People are going to want to gossip. And people will want to talk narshkite. And among people, there's machlokas and strife. And among people, there's division and divisiveness. Stay away from people. Go lock yourself in an ivory tower and put your nose in the books. And you want to become a gadol? You want to become great? Isolate. Withdraw. Says the vision, it's the opposite. Vayigdal Moshe. Moshe became great. Why? If you want to be great, then connect with people. If you want to be great, then care about people. If you want to be great, then practice unity among people. That is the story of, of greatness. That is the source of greatness. That is the path to greatness, is to be able to connect with other people, to connect with other people. Rabbi Yorcham has another insight. Says Yorcham, Rabbi Yorcham, Nasan Einav Rashi quotes, Vayar Besivlosa, Moshe goes out, and he sees their suffering. Nasan Einav Alibalios Meitzar Alayam. He placed his eye and his heart in order to feel their pain. So Rabbi Yerucham says, you know, there's an incredible integration between Gashmias and Ruchmias. They are inextricably tied and intertwined one with the other. They can't achieve spirituality without physicality. We elevate the physical. Our body is the instrument, is the vehicle to do spiritual things. You can't do a mitzvah without a body. You need your body in order to do the mitzvah. Similarly, just like you can't have ruchnis without gashmias, you can't do a mitzvah without the body to do the mitzvah, you also can't separate or divide the, the body from the ruchnis. Whatever you see with your eyes is connected to your soul. And that's why, says Rashi, Vayar Basivlosam, Moshe chose to see their pain. He paid attention, he read it, he looked because he wanted to feel their pain. He wanted to express that empathy. He could have looked away. He could have not read the headlines. He was protected in the palace. 
He specifically went because he wanted to condition his Gashmias to Ruchnias. We have to condition our Ruchnias to Gashmias. We also have to continue condition our Gashmias to Ruchnias. To look at things which will evoke certain attitudes and feelings and, and behaviors of who we are and of how we behave. Of how we behave. Okay, I have 10 more things to tell you. Let's see which of them I can quickly. One or two more, very, very quickly. Um, I'll give you one from Salavechik. Said the Rav on the words Asurana. Asurana, Perakimo Pasa Gimel. I'm sorry, we only got through the first half of the Parsha. There's so much on these Parshas, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Vayamar Moshe Asurana, Veres Amara, Gadol Azem, Adula Yivar Hasne. The bush is on fire, it's not being consumed. Moshe says, Let me turn and see what's going on. Let me turn to see what's going on. I have this image all the time now. Everybody else walked by this burning bush, this extraordinary supernatural phenomena, but they didn't notice it. Why not? <laughs> they were all texting and streaming and scrolling. You could walk right by a miracle. You could walk right by God. You could walk right by this supernatural, extraordinary phenomena. But if you're looking down, you're not going to notice what's going on right around you. Who was it? There's a famous musician who was playing in the subway in New York. Anyone remember his name? Joshua Bell, Violin, violinist, and he was playing in the subway and everybody walked by, nobody noticed. If they would have paid two blocks away to go hear him, they'd have to take out a mortgage. But he was playing for free in the subway, they walked right by him. Because in the subway, everybody's busy, they walked, they walked right by him. Asura now. Said Rabbi Salavechik, Rashi comments on these two words, I will leave the spot where I am in order to get a closer look. What did Rashi add with that sentence? Rashi explains that Moshe was not referring to moving physically. Let me step aside. He was stepping aside from a worldview and embracing a new philosophy of life, moving into a different frame of reference. Let me step aside from certain categories in which I used to think and adopt other categories, other concepts, other ideas. Similarly, at the Akedah, Avram told Eliezer and Yishmol, stay here with the donkey. Avram was not referring to geographical distance. He was referring to a different worldview. You remain with your philosophy, the philosophy of the donkey. Materialism, practicing um, pragmatism, everyday logic, but there's another worldview, the covenantal logic. And this is what Moshe said. Asura na, I must turn aside. Let me get away from the pragmatic logic of Yisro's estate manager. Let me adopt another set of rules, another philosophy, another worldview. Let me examine this great sight. He instinctively felt that something unusual was transpiring in front of him. Hashem tested Moshe to see how he would respond to this sight. Mo most people would not have responded. Great events have happened in our own time, said the Rav. Second World War, the Holocaust, State of Israel. The drama has not yet come to a close yet. We don't respond appropriately. We are not impressed. We lack sensitivity. When we see these things in the world, asurana, we should stop and turn to look. And the Rav says it's not a geographic or physical description. We should stop and turn to say, how does this change my view of the world? How does this change who I am? How does it change everything? That's what Avram did. That's what Moshe did. That's what we're meant to do. A lot more to talk about. See you tonight, 7.30, to talk about how the rush turned. From Spain and from France and Germany to Spain. And then we'll see you, please, God, next week, tomorrow morning. 8 15, 10 minutes of meeting. So, Sharm 8 45, Living with the Muna. Tomorrow night, we go behind the beam with Joseph Gittler, who is the founder of Le Leket, my good friend Joe Gittler. Till next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and stay holy.